guess that the nun too requires homework. Not me, yet here we are. I mean, it didn't ruin the movie, but I think that if I had remembered this guy, when he first showed up in the film, I would have been like, oh wow, what a great callback. But instead they were like, remember he was in the first movie? And I was like, not really, but that is cool. So, and I, and I even, so I saw the, I saw the first nun. I did see it and I thought it was okay. I know a lot of you hated it, but I thought it was not bad. Uh, but as I said, I totally forgot about him. But even if you haven't seen the first nun, also, as I just said, don't worry, the movie does catch you up. You can, you can jump right in with the nun too. Don't worry about it. Uh, I will say this, though, The Nun 2 and A Haunting in Venice, which come out a week apart, and in fact, A Haunting in Venice has advanced uh, fan screenings this very weekend. Might want to go check them out. I think it's a little bit of a better movie. Uh, But I saw them as back-to-back press screenings, and they are quite similar. Two very atmospheric Euro horror movies. The Nun 2 takes place in 1950s France, while uh, uh, A Haunting in Venice, I believe, takes place in 1940s Italy. Uh, and to be honest, A Haunting in Venice is also a lot like Knives Out, but I'll, I'll review uh, Haunting in Venice tomorrow. That's when the, um, the review embargo lifts tomorrow night, uh, Saturday night. Uh, so anyway, The Nun 2 is part of the Conjuring universe. Uh, but to me, those movies work best when they feature Patrick Wilson and Vera Farmia as the Warrens. Their love, their pureness, their genuine curiosity and what they're exploring and investigating, their belief uh, is really compelling and I think is what makes this franchise stand out and apart from a very, in a, in a, in a very crowded uh, uh, genre, a very crowded field, which we're definitely gonna talk about during this uh, review. But to me, they define this franchise. Uh, so, but here again, we have Farmia's sister, her younger sister, uh, much younger sister, uh, Tessa, in the lead role. But it's not just the same. So The Nun 2, instead of playing like a Conjuring movie, to me, plays like your standard good versus evil religious horror film. And who hasn't seen a ton of those by now? Uh, It's directed by Michael Chavez, who so far has worked exclusively in the Conjuring universe. And he's gotten progressively better. And on that note, this is his best movie to date. Uh, And it's better than the first Nun movie, which he didn't direct, but it's better than that movie. Although again, I told you I thought that movie was okay. Uh, But I think the first Nun movie, was a little bit too ambitious with its storyline and therefore didn't quite click. It tried to be like, I don't know, nun Indiana Jones. And while there's a little bit of that here, this is, this is simpler. It strips it down. It's just, again, it's like, it's like, do you like religious horror movies? Well, here's another one. Now, this was written by Akila Cooper, who I'm a big fan of. When I was considering seeing this, some of you were like, it's Akila Cooper, Grace. And I was like, I must go. But I have to say, it's not as clever or as creative as her recent scripts for Malignant or Megan, which put her on the map. Uh, and so, I, I, you know, lower your expectations if you're going for Akila Cooper's writing. But to her credit, she does kind of fix the nun movies by bringing them back to basics and, uh, you know, turning in a, a very solid standard entry in this type of movie. This is really, it's an exorcist type movie, but instead of a priest, you have nuns fighting demons, and that's been done by other movies as well. So it's not even unique to to the nun movies, quite frankly. Uh, But you gotta really up your game in the horror genre these days, because as I said, it is crowded. Before The Nun 2, I had to sit through trailers for A Haunting in Venice, which I had just seen the night before, Saw X, The the Exorcist Believer, and Five Nights at Freddy's, all movies that are coming out in the next few weeks. And I know that they all want to target the horror fans that turn out for The Nun 2. They should see how few people are there when the trailers play because people have reserved seats and stuff. I don't know if this happens where you are, but everybody comes like 20 to 30 minutes late to the movie. And I don't blame them because it's ridiculous how long it takes for a movie to get started. I check my watch very carefully, don't worry. Um, So it's because my watch is on my phone. But it was 20 minutes. It felt like 30 minutes to 40 minutes. But, you know, with all the ads and the stuff for the theater, and yay, Nicole Kidman. And then they were like, it's Dolby. And I'm like, I'm here every week. I don't need to see the Dolby intro. I know it's superior. That's why I'm here every week. But they make me watch it every single time I'm there. It's so annoying. Where's the skip intro button? So I watched all those horror movies. And so by the time the actual movie, those trailers, so by the time The Nun 2 started, I was already pretty horrid out. I was like, okay, let's watch this one. 
I think they make so many horror films these days because they're so lucrative, so I don't blame them. But because of that, you really need to stand out from the crowd to go beyond hardcore horror fans. Because I know some of you are like, I'm seeing every one of these. But you know, they're not gonna make a lot of money if they don't have a broad if they don't have broader appeal. And of all those trailers, so I looked at them analytically. I was like, since I'm watching them, I might as well do some work. So I was like, which of these have unique qualities that stand out? And I would say Haunting in Venice. And then also Saw X, which is interesting because I've never seen any of those movies. I don't, I do not care for the Saw movies. I don't care for that type of film. And I'm not gonna see this one. But I, from an analytical perspective, I was like, hmm, they keep it fresh. I think they have an interesting new hook there. Literally sometimes with Saw. Hook, get it? All right, so anyway, does The Nun 2 stand out? Even once I've seen the full movie, meh. I mean, I was just in Europe for The Equalizer 3 and A Haunting in Venice. I mean, those are both Italy, this is, Fran uh, this is France, but you know, at first I thought it was Italy, quite frankly. So I would say this doesn't really stand out. It's more for hardcore horror fans who will see all of these movies and this will be a nice appetizer for you. I think it's good it's coming first. It's definitely an appetizer type movie. An amuse-bouche. <laughs> they should put that on the poster. That would be perfect. All right, so anyway, and everyone else can watch it on digital when they're stuck around Halloween and they're like, what's something I haven't seen? Ah, The Nun too. I mean, it's good enough that you can watch it. Uh, they can also put that on the posters. <laughs> it's good enough that it's, you can watch it. I mean, it has a lot of jump scares, and every time I've talked about, usually when I talk about some of these movies, you guys are like, ah, oh, those are just jump scare movies. We hate them. But I, don't, I haven't historically minded jump scare movies, although now that I'm watching more of them, I kind of am starting to see where some of you are coming from, because they're just so obvious how they're set up. They're like, slowly pan right, awkwardly pan left, oh, there's something scary here. And you're like, I see the strings. So yeah, I think I appreciate movies that maybe try to do a little bit better. Uh, the nicest thing about this film is the location. 1950s France is pretty nice, obviously. Very atmospheric, and the camera work is okay. And they really found some great locations and built some awesome sets, so I like that. I was like, okay, you got, you got the atmosphere. There's also some nice icono uh, iconography, particularly with the appearances of the nun. There was a smoke trick that I was like, that's nice. Uh, and the actress who plays the nun, by the way, speaking of visuals, is suing Warner Brothers for not paying her her cut of the merch. And before you're like, well, maybe she should have signed a better contract. Well, she claims it is in her contract and they're lying about the numbers so they have to pay her less. Aw, I mean, she's, that's like the only thing this lady has and she's so good at it and she is the nun. So much of what makes the nun work is her facial structure and her performance. So pay the lady her money. So anyway, her kills also are visually interesting. And there's a goat man that she conjures up, by the way, that was also pretty neat. I was like, oh, I like that, 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 that was nice. Uh, Chavez, his production and costume designers and his VFX teams, both practical and digital, did some nice work here. Uh, wouldn't that be enough to make the movie stand out though? What, come on, Grace. Well, the story is so paper thin. Ah, so paper thin. And while the visuals are nice, they're not mind blowing. I'm not like, wow. Instead I was like, no, I appreciate that. Again, as I said, an amuse-bouche. Uh, Cause like, also, like there's a religious artifact that has tremendous importance in the story, but I felt like the payoff did not match the buildup. I was like, that's it, really? I think you could have done something cooler with that. I mean, they came up with a really cool religious artifact and I was like, that is cool. It's kind of creepy. I think you could really do something with that. And then they never even really took him out of the case. All right, so anyway, as for the cast, Tessa Farmia really does come across as a junior Vera Farmia. So that makes this like The Conjuring Junior, like it's a young adult novel from The Conjuring Universe. Uh, also, Jonas Blo uh, Blockett, I can see why they brought him back. Even though I forgot him entirely, I, again, I mean, I kind of think I remember him doing a good job in the first movie, but I liked him here. He was good. I, was, I think it was more like, I can see why you brought him back, even though I don't remember him. Uh, and a lot is asked of him as an actor, not only emotionally, but physically as well. And that's all I will say about him. Uh, he did a nice job. Uh, with newcomers, Storm Reed is having an incredible year, and many of you are rooting for her in this movie. And I totally get that. I'm rooting for Storm Reed too. I'm really happy. You know, A Wrinkle in Time totally seemed like it was going to torpedo her career before it started, but she didn't give up, and she's really building a very nice career for herself. 
But I have to say, this is her smallest role of the year. Uh, and there are glimmers of a more interesting role earlier on in the film, but that's all dropped by the time they get to the second half, and she just becomes Farmia's sidekick. I mean, a very capable sidekick, but a sidekick nonetheless. Uh, I'd certainly say she's a good addition to this franchise, but as for Storm Reid herself, like for the franchise, should try and keep her, because she's good. But for Storm Reid, she can and should get a better role. It's just, I think this role is kind of beneath her, quite frankly. I bet she's filmed, I wouldn't be surprised, I mean, she certainly did it before she did The Last of Us and Missing, because now she's too big for what they gave her here. It's also worth noting that Akila Cooper, be the change from within, added a character of color to the Nun movies and to the Conjuring universe. And so I think that's fantastic. And But also Akila Cooper did a fantastic job you know, across the board. She didn't totally shift the focus. She uh, was faithful to the story, but added this great new character and a wonderful opportunity, you know, well, you know, if Storm Reid hadn't been in those other projects, this would be a really great opportunity for her. And it does, I mean, certainly doesn't look bad on Storm Reid's resume that she's in the Conjuring universe. But, Akila Cooper thought up a very specific backstory for this character of color, and I wonder if in earlier drafts or cuts of the film, they did not drop it, but instead explored it further, because there were some really great opportunities there. And I can't see Cooper, who is a very talented screenwriter, dropping something like that. In fact, I bet she had a good idea for what to do with the religious artifact, and they must have dropped it, because Akila Cooper don't roll that way. Keila Cooper is a great screenwriter. Um, I'm so excited to see what she does with Megan 2.0. Uh, but I think she did what she could here. Uh, Anna Popplewell, all grown up from the Narnia movies, I thought she looked familiar, makes an impression as a potential love interest for Blockhead, uh, who seemed like he also was maybe into Farmia's nun. I was like, what's going on here? Hmm, it seems like you guys have a past, but you've only known her as a nun. I mean, it was weird because at the beginning of the movie, they built him up as like being so genuine. But then when Farmia showed up, he was like, ah, oh, hello. And I was like, is this guy a player? So that took me out of it a little bit. Uh, Caitlin Rose Downey, no relation to Robert Downey Jr., looked it up, but Caitlin Rose Downey, a relatively new actress, is a very good find. I thought she was great. Although the mean girls who torment her at her, her French boarding school deserve a shout out as well, because they, they were very good at their job. And they were not just mean girls, but French mean girls. That was great. And I liked uh, Suzanne Burdish a lot too. Like Aaron's, she has a great look for horror. So while I wouldn't make The Nun 2 a first choice when it comes to watching a horror movie, or even a second choice, it does get the job done. So keep that in mind uh, if, if you need that horror itch scratched in theaters or down the line on digital or streaming. Share your thoughts down below, subscribe today, and of course, as always, you can check out some more videos right now.